So she came back and we walk, I don't know, 10, 10 to 20 feet. And another snipe flushes. She comes back, grabs the snipe, and comes down. So perfect, let's feed the falcon. So I end up feeding the falcon and let's go to the car. So on the way back on the car, there's this tree on the way out. And I say, well, I'm just gonna be curious. I'm gonna walk to that tree and see what, what really happened. And as soon as I get to the tree, I see the snipe dead next to the tree. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Welcome back for another episode of the Falconry Told Podcast and what is now the third episode of our follow-up series featuring falconers from Mexico. And of course, I have to give a quick shout out to the North American Falconers Association and the Falconry Fund, whose small grants program help make projects like this possible. If you're interested in joining, donating, or supporting either one of these organizations, or to find out more information, please head to n-a-f-a.com for the North American Falconers Association and falconryfund.org for the Falconry Fund. And in this episode, I get a chance to sit down with Danielle and discuss some of the really nice snipe hawking that I got a chance to see for the first time while I was down there. I have to say that of all the forms of hawking that I've seen in person so far, especially with long wings, this is the most fun and challenging form of it that I've yet to see. And I really hope that I get to do it myself someday. I was uh, really entertained and had a lot of fun watching this happen. It was, uh, it was a great time. And Danielle is uh, very experienced and has a long history in falconry. So I hope you all get something out of this episode, as with all the others, and you enjoy it. Here we go. Well, I mean, it was a good hunt today, like you said. As I mentioned, this is the only like the second, maybe third time that I've gotten to actually see peregrines hunt. And the, each time I, you know, that's happened, it's, it's been in Mexico. So ironically enough, like I said, it's, I didn't figure I'd have to leave the country for the first time to, <laughs> to see those things. But I'm, I'm glad that I've, I've gotten the chance to see your birds fly. And uh, congratulations on the last two days. Thank you. And welcome to Mexico, John. Yeah, thank you. And just for the record, we can go ahead and get out of the way that you told me before that I was officially your good luck charm. You are. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. And this is the first time that I've actually gotten to see snipe hunted. And, you know, like I said, when I was telling you before, you know, I've, I've always heard about it, but seeing it in person, I think by far and away so far, at least is probably the coolest thing that I've gotten a chance to see is Peregrine on Snipe. So, They're tough. Yeah. They're not, it's not an easy prey. Yeah. Snipes are tough. Today you, you, today you got to see the comparison between one of the Falcons and the other one. Mm-hmm. One make it look easy because he actually stroke one on mm-hmm. the way down. Mm-hmm. And kill it. The, the other one chased like I don't know five or six, and he couldn't. He couldn't make it. Yeah. So it's, snipe is it's a really really difficult prey. You need the falcon to be right on top of you for the flush, mm-hmm. or a little bit more higher. But it all depends on the terrain. If you have a lot of cover, it's complicated because they'll make it to cover, mm-hmm. and you want the snipe to flush and go try to evade the falcon and going up, with, yeah. which provides an excellent flight. Like I said, I've I've not ever seen it before, and getting a chance to see how you all do things compared to some of the different ways that I, I'm unfortunate. I mean, I know there, I know a, a couple of guys that hunt snipe in the U.S., but they're all the way across the country from me, pretty much. So, like I said, it's not something I've I don't know how or if they even do things differently, you know, in their approach to how you guys would do it. I think I think it, it has a lot to do with the terrain, depending on on where you're flying the falcons. Mm-hmm. Here in in this part of Mexico, where we fly them, it's a wetland that mm-hmm. you you can see. It's full of docks, and but there's a lot of channels of water and and uh, a lot of irrigation. So it's it's not as easy as as other places where there's a grassland has a little bit of, of water, like the the place we we flew the other day. These places are tougher for you for walking. You you, you had a, a good experience wearing waders, <laughs> but uh, but it makes it difficult for for 
for everybody to get to the to the point where you find the snipe and flushing it. Uh, and turns out it, it's it's a lot of power for Nalia to bring the Falcon to a good spot, but it's always fun when you catch one. It seems, like I said, the, to be one of the most fun things you can do to, you know, and when, whenever you're hunting with a peregrine or any other long wing, it seems like one of the most fun methods. But I, I can also see where where it could be extremely frustrating too. <laughs> yeah, for me, for me, it's been always my favorite prey. Well, for starters, is because the place that I live here, it was the the, the, the one of the preys, the main preys that I found besides dogs. Uh, but dogs here are, are tricky because you need to find them in good spots. Otherwise, they're, as you can see, today was very complicated flushing them out of a river. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you find snipe in good numbers and, and you have a Cheersville falcon or, a, I don't know, a smaller a smaller species like Barbary's red napes, they fly them amazing. I, I used to fly a Barbary for 18 years and, uh, and she did well with snipes. She was like totally expert but uh this guy is catching up he's young but his first season he's he's doing it good he'll become a good one it looks like it looks like you're on yeah. the, the right track with him yeah. yeah he will i think i think he's he'll manage he's because he's been hunting a lot of uh shore birds you know like mm -hmm. the kill deer and, and other other species that are migratory birds which are pretty fast and, and tough to catch but uh they they gave a the falcon a lot of sport. They need to really really make an effort to to get them, and uh, and of course the falcon are chasing around in the mud. It's it's not easy. <laughs> no no and and um, yeah. Whenever you're having to cross these ditches that are you know waist deep full of water and and you're also hunting with dogs too, which is a, a whole other dynamic and making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do and, and, uh, everything on top of that. I mean, I, I could definitely see where this form of hunting along with like quail hunting and, and, um, yeah, it, it's pretty necessary, you know, to have dogs involved and stuff. Yeah. As well. Dogs, but, dogs actually work fine until they don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing that you, you gotta make them really, really obedient. Otherwise they can, they can really screw a flight or, or they can make a flight good mm -hmm. when they're, when they're obedient, they usually help a lot. And sometimes they, you, have you seen my Britain Spaniels? They sometimes point really good and they hold for the Falcon and, and everything works out fine. Other times they just keep running and they'll, they'll keep flushing everything out and screw at everything. And sometimes you catch something while they're flushing, but of course it's easier if you go step by step, like we did it with the, with Jerry this morning, like walking a little bit, hold on for the Falcon to turn around and step by step. That's, I, I mean, that's key for, for catching snipes. Mm -hmm. And how did you initially learn how to, how to hunt snipe? Well, uh, I, I didn't learn because I, I learned by trial and error <laughs> because nobody was hunting snipes back mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I read some books that I read on NAFA and, and, uh, a guy from New Mexico, I don't remember his name right now. He was flying in a Barbary, a Tiersel Barbary. He caught some some snipes, not consistently because of the place where he was hunting. And he gave me some of the advice and everything. And um, back in the days, like, I don't know, I was like 20, 20 or something. I want 51, <laughs> just so they know. <laughs> and I was flying a female prairie falcon and this place where i was flying here to pigeons you had a few snipes so i started chasing the snipes with the prairie falcon but there was no way i mean that prairie falcon will go up way way high i mean i don't know 500 meters up there mm -hmm. and i will flush the snipes the snipes will go up in the sky and here comes the female stooping all the way down and you said you will think that's a dead snipe and she they will always always the bait here. I couldn't catch a single snipe during, I don't know, one season. And I tried and tried and tried, but she was too big. And I think she was not fast, as, fast enough. So then we were able, Alex Franco that you already met and I, we imported some Barbaries from Les Boyd, 
from the States. And we got five birds. I kept one. Alex, he wanted to breed a couple. And then he had a, a pair that he was flying. And I kept a female, which was named Miss Piggy. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she she uh, we call her like that because she she was the youngest of the five barberies, but she will eat like a pig, like she will <laughs> fight with everybody and will get the bigger peas and mm. so we we start calling her Piggy, and she became quite good at catching snipe. The first snipe that I flushed for that bird, uh, she went down exactly at the same spot where I was flying the prairie the prairie the other seasons. And she couldn't catch any. And the first snipe that I flushed for her, she came down and grabbed it in the middle of the air, landed next to me, looking at me like, chop, chop, chill, chop. <laughs> I was like, damn, this bird is going to be awesome. <laughs> and then from then on, I move on. And I don't know that the first season I caught like, I don't know, 12 or 15 snipes. I don't remember. It was years ago. Uh, she became pretty good with years, with uh, each season. But she she be really 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 became specialist in snipes because I will flush kill deer for her, and she will miss them because she will try to catch them from underneath, and they will always evade her. I mean she will catch one or two each season, but she was never so good at it. This guy the the Benancio the Tearsel Peregrine, is catching seventeen so far so, kill deer, mm -hmm. and probably like fifteen snipes so far. Besides all her dogs and stuff like that, that have been flushed. And uh, I think he has a pretty good future with that. That barbary became pretty famous because I, I was able to wrote a few articles about her at NAFA, the journal, and uh, and another one from the British Falconers Club. And with that bird, we hunted for 18 seasons and she passed away. She was really, really good. She called around. I don't know, 50 to 60 each season. And of course, a few dogs. When every, every time I went up there to Aguascalientes with Martin, mm -hmm. we will fly her at dogs and it will be fun. Yeah. Cheers, by the way. Cheers. Yes. Yeah. Now, um, so if I remember right, I remember someone, maybe it was you or maybe it was um, Jerry that was telling me that I know you kind of touched on it just briefly. A minute ago, but you're one of the first guys that actually flew Barbaries in Mexico, correct? Or actually had them? Back then, like 30 years ago, it was impossible to import birds. So we tried. And I mean, that's like a, a whole story about it. It's so complicated. They got stuck at customs for days and it was a mess. But at the end, we were able, through a lot of work and and... and and connections, we were able to get them out of customs and and start flying them. Alex lost all the birds on the first season. The breeding ones, he kept them, but they never breed here. I don't know why. So I kept flying mine. And I flew that bird for for 18 seasons. And in the, in the meantime, I flew other birds, uh, another red nape that we import from the States. From, I think this bird was from, from Drisco. The guy that makes, well, I think he passed away now. The guy that makes the the blocks for the falcons, so these super fancy blocks. He had a bunch of falcons breeding, and we got some red napes from him. I got a female, which was a blonde female, it was a beautiful falcon, I mean, gorgeous. At the beginning, she was like super tame, and, and I didn't so much so much future about it. Like she was, eh took me a while to get her going but uh she started flying good and then then she started catching snipes unfortunately i flew her for two seasons and in the middle of the second season i lost her uh she went chasing some i don't know what was it a, a bird long long flight and uh, she didn't came back so i started chasing her and i found the transmitter back in the days uh, she had the transmitter in her, at her, I think at the backpack, I don't know if it was the backpack or her leg, but I found the transmitter on the ground and I never saw her again. We, th we threw pigeons for days and everything and she disappeared. But that bird managed to catch also snipes. Then I had another, it was a passage in Atum, a female, a small one, which she flew around 640 grams. Um, that bird 
that bird was pretty good. She was her name was Juana because Juan Berum and a friend from me in Aguascalientes, he he trapped it for me and gave it to me. And that bird was really a killer bird. She will catch anything that you flush for her. Besides, she was a female, but she she will fly pretty good. And I managed to catch some snipes with that bird also. Really, really interesting flights. But I think the Tyrosels are more up to the challenge than the females. Hmm. I'm sure a good female will catch them also. Well, and as far as training methods and how you went about teaching these birds how to do whatever you wanted them to do, how much of a deviation was there? How much of a difference was there between how you went about training each of these different species or if there was any? The Barbary, the Red Nape, and the, the Chamber Rays Anatum, the Tirzel that I'm flying, I basically trained them, trained them the same way. I use uh, a trap house sparrows, common sparrow, the, well, the English sparrow. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, since they're young, I mean, I, I, get, I get them out of the field, like like tame hacking, you put it on top of the car, and I still, I'll walk there and I'll start throwing sparrows like madman. <laughs> and, and the falcons, they'll just start chasing everything they see. And eventually they, they start flying around you and, and I don't know, 10 feet, then 20 feet. And you, you just throw them a hard one, then you throw them an easy one and, and like that. When, and, and we were able to, to get a lot of sparrows here from some of the local stores where they sell the uh, animal food, you know, for, for chickens and porks and everything. They have problems with sparrows. So they love when we go there and put the nets and yeah, we get a lot of sparrows. So I, I, I start like that, then I switch usually to pigeons, hard pigeons. They'll chase them or, or, or Asian dopes, you know, the color dopes, which it's hard because they're usually, they don't fly much, but you need to keep them in a really large cage so they, they'll be fit. And I use those for baggies also at the starting time. And as soon as the Falcon has, I don't know, 30 feet of height or 30 meter of height, sorry. Uh, I'll start flushing game for them, like whatever, the sparrows, blackbirds, whatever there is in the field, and, and they'll start chasing, like try to do it more naturally, like like the way they are when they're growing up. And eventually they'll start going up, and eventually we get the migration here, and, and we get all the birds, and we start flushing them. And, they start to connect. They usually connect the young birds. They catch some larks, some horn larks, which are super tough birds to catch with a falcon. But uh, they'll catch those. They catch uh, blackbirds and middle larks, stuff like that. They flush uh, morning doves. Also, they sometimes you found them. Not here. There are some, but not in in uh, very flyable fields because it's as you see, there's a lot of water everywhere. So the places that they are, they're eating on the cornfields and it's, you got to wait a lot during the season so that they cut the cornfields and you can flush them decently. Yeah. And as far as like time frame, just out of curiosity also, like with these different species, have you experienced it being roughly the, roughly the same time frame as far as training, begin initial training and then ready to hunt? They're, they usually be ready in 30 days. I yeah. Mean more or less some some earlier some some 40 or, or 45 days but if you you gotta keep you you, you gotta keep flying them every day mm-hmm. if you're not willing to do that sacrifice of course they're not gonna develop into good falcons i mean unless you have like a tame hack where you can let them go and and and, and let the falcon develop mm-hmm. I, I think you gotta do the effort at least at the beginning like take them out every day and and be consistent. Other, otherwise, the falcons, I don't think they'll, they'll perform good. And when you take them out, I'm assuming you're taking them out pretty much the same times each day and all that kind of stuff just to keep consistency. And- yes, every every day early in the morning, I'll be there at, at sun, sun, uh, sunrise, probably, I don't know, 7, 6.30, and set the falcon loose and, and start doing the flights for one hour, two hours, as long as, as uh, when the falcon performs good and he's able to catch something, I'll feed him up and I'll take him back to to the car and away we go. But uh, 
of course, if you have two birds that are that could fly together and they're tame, it's also helpful because they chase each other and you know they start playing games and they get stronger and stronger. And yeah, I think it, I think it makes it easier. I did that with the Barbary because we had the other four brothers. So they flew together and they would chase each other all around the field, which was excellent for getting fit. Uh, the other thing is here we get wild per wild peregrines and they will start chasing mine birds and, and they chase each other. They're like playing like all, all over the sky and, and it w I think it's good. Unless they, they, they don't become that aggressive or anything. So they just, it's like another brother that they found out there. <laughs> Well, that's funny. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, it's good information. I'm, like I said, I'm always curious to find how guys are doing, you know, their personal, you know, if they're willing to share that is, you know, their personal experience and how uh, yeah, they Yeah. Homing, homing pigeons, they work after the, if you, when you get the falcon feet and it's going up, I use the homing pigeons when, when it's out of position because they usually chase them, you know, but never can catch them. Yeah. It, well, sometimes they catch them because they intimidate them. Hmm. And, but they're, they, they're very helpful. They'll, they'll chase a pigeon out of the sky and then come back and you can serve them something a little bit easier. It's always good. But, uh, as soon as I can, uh, start hunting, I, I, I don't never, I never use baggies again. I, as soon as they start hunting there, I mean, unless it's, it was been a great day and nothing came out or whatever. Okay. Then I'll throw a pigeon, but otherwise I'll use the lure and I'll just fly the falcon back to lure because I think otherwise they forget about the lures and then you have a bird that is going away two kilometers away and it will never come back and these guys they see the lure and they come back immediately which is always a safe one like I said I've, I've had very limited experience with long wings so I'm always intrigued to see if there's different ways that you know ways you can make it work in different areas that you normally wouldn't be able to think you can make it work and and just seeing how different people go about their training methods is always interesting to me. Pass passage birds are all the story. I mean, passage birds just got to tame it down. They'll fly and you flush something. Ready to go. <laughs> They'll go after it. Yeah. You don't need to do anything genius or anything. Just yeah. make them come back to lure or whatever. And, and they'll, man they'll manage. They're, they're pretty smart. And they've been they've been in the wild or by their own so, much, so long. So... Uh, they appreciate the help. Yeah. Well, and with passage birds too, it's, it's helpful to go ahead and, and get them out as soon as you can anyway, so they don't lose their natural yeah. fitness and, and everything also, I'm sure. But yeah. The female, the passage that I'm flying, uh, I think she took the, her first quarry was a, a teal the day 35 after trapped. So it was pretty fast. She was flying free on 20 days. She became tame really, really, really fast and, and was was really cooperating and, and, and helpful. Well, awesome. Now, and as far as just in general, I guess this would be a good time to talk about how, for whatever reason, the, the falconry bug bit you and, you know, what got you into all this in the first place and, um, you know, just go from there, I guess. Well, I, I, I went, I, I got involved into falconry when I was, a little kid, I always loved animals. I was fascinated with animals and hunting. And my dad had a bunch of friends that they were like African hunters, you know, and they have all these wild game uh, on their houses. And, and I just love that kind of stuff and, and, and loved animals. So I went with my brother once to this local market in Mexico city, Mexico city, I've just seen is crowded and it's a crazy city, huge. <laughs> And they have this local market where they used to sell wildlife. I mean, parrots and and anything you want, like a baby coyote or you name it. It was uh, wildlife traffic at the most. So I went there with my brother. He wanted to get a parrot, uh, baby parrot or something. And I was like nine years old. And there's this guy with, at the market with a kestrel in his hand. And I said, like, what? I said, Forget about the parrot. Let's get the kestrel. <laughs> and he said, no, no, no. I want the parrot. So then I, back back in those days, uh, there were no phones. So I, I went to a phone, to the local phone at the market and called my parents. Can I get the falcon, please? And of course, I didn't have any money or anything. 
And they were like, no way, you forget it, no Falcon for you, just come back home and that's it. So we came, we came back home and, and I was so intense for one week about that damn Falcon that my mother said, here, here's the money, go buy the Falcon. <laughs> so I went back to the market a week ago and luckily the guy had, still had the Kestrel and I bought the Kestrel. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I was fascinated and it was like, it was hooked. So I started looking for information, but back then there were no, I mean, this was early eighties. There was no internet, there was no nothing. So I started searching, my dad had a, a huge collection of a National Geographic magazine. And I started looking through each one of them for years, I don't know, a 30 year collection. And I found the Craighead articles and, and a few others about Falcon So then I got, I got a little clue about what was I doing, but there were no books. Mexico was a closed economy. So there weren't much of things imported here. It was, it was complicated getting information. So I managed to get that Kestrel to jump to the feast. I don't know how, but I managed to, to get it. I was actually feeding him terrible food because the guy in the market told me you should feed the Falcon, uh, beef, uh, heart, only beef heart. <laughs> I was like, why will they be eating beef heart? But anyways, I, I stick to the plan and ask my mother, I need to get a beef heart every week. <laughs> <laughs> beef heart, of course, will, they will feed the Kestrel for two months. It's huge. But anyway, <laughs> I kept that Kestrel for years, uh, not for years, for one season, probably. Uh, I was able to fly to the fees, you know, like super slow and a cat got it. That was the end of the castle. So I went back to the market and I, <laughs> and I wanted another bird. This time I, I think I was nine years old or 10 and I got a Harris hawk, a young Harris hawk. And, and I was lucky enough back then to see a guy that was my neighbor. He was flying a Harris hawk around my house. And I used to live in Mexico city and he was flying. There was like, like open terrain next to my house. He was flying the Harris Hawk to the feast. So I decided to, I was like looking at him and say, wow. He, and he started teaching me a bit and, and he was a member of the NAFA. His name is Eduardo Rivera. And he was like, I don't know, 10 years older than me. And he said, Hey, no, no, here I have some books that I bought in the States. And you can read him. So I went through all his library that he had. He was kind enough to show me. And he has, he had hoods and experience and, and he experienced trapping pergines and everything. So he taught me how to trap, uh, kestrels with ball, ball trees and stuff like that. And I learned a lot and I got into NAFA. Once I got into NAFA, I was like, phew, and it start, started making contact with other people by letters back then was, was letters. So, so it was fun then. Then with the, the Harris Hawk, I trained the Harris Hawk and this area that I live in Lomas, there, there, were, there were a lot of, uh, uh, open terrains that were like wooded areas and they had a lot of rats, like city rats. That was the main prey for the Harris Hawk. <laughs> so I killed hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of rats, which I kept in the, in the fridge of my mother. She never knew that. Now she knows she does. <laughs> Disgusting, disgusting sewer rats, but I caught so many, but I was proud as if I was catching <laughs> snipe right now, back in the days, it was amazing catching, catching rats with the Harris hawk. Yeah. I can only imagine if she would have known that those were actually there, what she would have probably done to you. No, no, <laughs> she will kill me. I mean, it was insane <laughs> keeping them in the fridge, but uh, we caught so many rats with those Harris. So, so they're one of my, my cousins, he got another Harris Hawks. So we will fly the Harris Hawks with rats. And, and we, we grew up with the Harris Hawks when back in the days for, I don't know, for until I was like 15 or, or 16. Then I, then I started flying, a, a roadside Hawk, which is a tiny red tail. That I, I was telling you the other day, it's a small Hawk, the tropical areas. Um, they're pretty fun. You know, I flew, I flew it out of the tea perch and they would chase birds and catch everything from uh, rattlesnakes to birds, frogs, uh, scorpions, whatever was running out of there. <laughs> that, uh, they, they will only chase it for, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes and he was done. And then, then I moved to flying 
of course by by then I, uh, I was already learning a lot and I had a books and and I was in touch with Alex Franco my friend who was also involved in in flying falcons and, and everything he, he he was flying Cooper's Hawks back then and then we went trapping uh, for aplomados and we caught up a, a couple of them at the beach in Veracruz at the Gulf of Mexico and I started flying aplomados back then when Harry McElroy was living in Mexico back then in Querétaro. And we had some advice of, of her, from Harry, of course. And uh, we started flying the Aplomados and uh, they were super successful. We will we'll flow them at, at Quail, which of course we have to drive a lot because in Mexico City area, there's nothing like Quail. You, you gotta drive at least two hours to the next place. And we, we flew those birds for, I don't know, around three seasons or four seasons until I lost it again. Transmitters back then were, I think I was using the first transmitters were the LL electronics, uh, the ones that you stick the battery and mm -hmm. you put a rubber band on it. And, and they they were okay, they, they were helpful, but it, I mean, it wasn't the safest, the safest bet ever, but it, yeah. they worked. And I lost the Aplomato with the transmitter. I never, I never saw her again. She, she took a bird and up in the tree, she will feed on the bird. She will usually come down. That day I went, went to the car, I don't know, pick up something. And when I came back to the tree, she, she disappeared. Never found her, not a single beep, anything. Mm. Battery must've fell out or something, you know, who knows? Yeah. Apple mouse are fun also. Yeah. I mean, they're on, they're on a list of birds that I'd like to fly eventually, but you know, where I'm at with, with Apple mottos and in the other smaller expensive bird do the main worry is that they're always going to end up being coop food you know and uh you know i just yeah I can, it's easy yeah. yeah from aplomados we we start trapping peregrines at the beach uh, which is also a lot of fun trapping birds and i flew a couple of tundras uh i don't know they didn't last a month they will usually fly away without transmitters i didn't even use the transmitter but but they were fun i mean I, and i was start i was starting to catch little birds with them and i had a tears hill tundra which was really good and i lost him chasing morning doves and never came back but um those were fun until then i get up got the prairie falcon which i flew for four or five years and then the barbaries and well well i was flying the barbaries i flew like a two or three Anatom Peregrine's passage pairs, I think two. So overall in your experience, you, it sounds like you definitely are more of a long wing guy, prefer long wings and, and, uh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And what's the reason for that? Just flight style or just, uh, I it's personality for me, for me, it's more complicated and well, well, you know, when everything is so complicated <laughs> and you get it right, it's, uh -huh. it's really satisfying and, and it's amazing. I like the, I like Falcons better. I mean, one of those trips to the local market, I, I bought a Micraster, semi Torquatus, you know, those jungle Falcons, the crazy, like a prehistoric bird. And she, she was a, an imprint and she was so such a dangerous bird i mean she would chase me and grab me by the back and <laughs> they're so strong i mean for the size of these birds they're they're like super strong like strong as a red tail a female and it was a, it was a terrible experience but it, well, it was interesting <laughs> at the end i think she got sick because i she ate a, a coot and, and she didn't make it but um, I, I tried, uh, I think I, I tried one passage, Cooper's Hawk. I caught a few birds, uh, another one that was a, a baby from a nest, but I didn't, I, I, I wasn't really good at it. And I think I liked better the falcon. So I focused more on long wings. And I've, I, I was able to meet a few guys from the States and from Colorado, basically the Colorado Hawking Club, Ken Mesh that passed away and Chris Kurt and Donny Head, those guys, they invite us over to hunt sage grouse at Wyoming and Colorado and gave us a lot of big idea of the, what you could do with falcons was, was amazing. 
So uh, I I love I love flying uh, and hunting falcons, not just flying them to pigeons. Which a lot of people in Mexico they they only fly them to pigeons. They for sport or whatever I don't know. But for me, it was the hunting. I, I, I've been a hunter all my life, and I needed to, to catch game. The real, the real falconer. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And, and I'm assuming throughout your your years, and part of the reason why you've been able to be so successful with long wings, especially, and and like you said, cons- consistency, especially, is is key with them. And I mean, honestly, with most birds of prey, I mean, really, I mean, the yeah. more consistent you are, the better. But I mean, what have you, what have you done for, for a living and, and you know, what, 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 how have you been able to, to achieve the consistency that you have had all these years with, with work and everything? I, I grew up in Mexico city mm-hmm. and, um, uh, I went to college for law school and I started working as lawyer and I, I have my own law firm when I was well, uh, I mean, I, I did okay. And uh, as soon as I, c- I got married, I moved out of Mexico City and came here all the way to Toluca, which is, I don't know, 40, 40 to an hour drive, w- w- where you can find open fields and, and, and you can f- fly the Falcons better. And uh, at the beginning, it was hard. I mean, I, I will wake up at night every day and and be there at sunrise and fly the falcon get the falcon back and speed back to the to my house take a shower and be at the law firm and then work all day come back <laughs> at night sleep the same thing you know day by day and uh, i will try to be as consistent as i could of course <laughs> uh, which was very complicated and uh, after i lived here at toluca for 11 years first then I had a problem with a security problem. Um, my wife back then was kidnapped. Yeah. It was wow. nasty. Ugh. And uh, after that incident, we moved to San Diego, uh, California. Two weeks later, and I we stayed there for eight years. That's heavy. And she stayed there for eight years, basically. I got a divorce, and uh, and I moved back two years ago here. So in the meanwhile, I was coming back and forth, which was a mess, and I couldn't practice falconry those eight years. I, I, I had to quit, which was pretty difficult for me, and it was, I was not happy at all. <laughs> uh, well, that's uh, in, that's insane, though. I mean, I can understand yeah. having to, you know, hang up the hang up the back the game bag and the in the boots for a little while to. No, uh, especially when, when you're like me and you're so intense and you try to do it every day as the most as you can. And California was was Southern California's car for flying falcons. They don't have these open fields and everything is private. You need a lot of permissions or it's too crowded and, and difficult. I mean, you could fly Cooper's work or something. But for me, it was complicated because I had to go back and forth for work. There was no way I could keep a falcon up there and uh, be gone for two weeks and then come back two weeks and it will be terrible falconry. You cannot practice falconry like that. Falconry, you got to be consistent, otherwise it's terrible. You you won't enjoy it. Yeah, and and I've, you know, the last couple of years, especially with, with my schedule and, and um, you know, having to work out of town a lot with with uh, different contract work and, and things like that, I've, I wholeheartedly agree. Anytime you have to make extra provisions around just the basic aspects of your schedule and falconry and it stops being fun and it starts being stressful and it's not supposed to be stressful it's supposed to be fun so yeah i mean if if you can't do it to whatever degree that you think that you can do it consistently and competently sometimes it's just better to not do it at all yeah i i I didn't do it and i just flew back to aguascalientes with martin uh, he invited me over a couple of two or three times a year and we'll stay there at his house and we'll catch dogs and had a great time. Well, you've been there. It's always fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that, that was my, like my medicine for falconry for your, your fix for, <laughs> for the eight years that I was away. Yeah. And uh, until I, I mean, everything changed and I decided to come back here and stay here. 
and now I'm I'm doing it all the way back. <laughs> Intense, as you could see. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, though. I'm glad that you're able to to finally get a chance to start doing it again consistently and uh, and scratch the itch, so to speak. That's great. Yeah, we're doing it good. Uh, last last season, I started with a with a female peregrine that you you saw today and the other day, and uh, this season with 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 the Tearsville Peregrine Benancio, which is doing great. Perfect. Well, I guess this would be a good time to do like we usually do and transition to the whole, you know, the, the aspect of what some of your favorite memories are and all these years that you've been doing this. And, you know, what are some of your, your most memorable hunting, hunting experiences or not just hunting experiences, but either memories with particular birds or, you know, things like that. And, you know, share a few of them with us. Yeah, sure. Uh, with Piggy, uh, she was she was a, a really keen falconer for the snipes. One day we were hunting on these wetlands, uh, kind of like the place that we took you today. And she was, I don't know, a hundred meters up there, right on top of us. Back then I used a Springer Spaniel. I wasn't using a Brittany, it was, it was a Springer. And she was really, really good. She will find any bird that was in the field. She flushed a snipe, Piggy came down, and it was it was a hard flight. And I think, I, th I, th I, th I thought she didn't hit the snipe like next to a tree and she came back because usually when she hits something, she will turn around and land there and grab it. But she came back, so I thought oh, she missed. It was, you know, with all the ditches and everything, it was, it was quite a walk to get there. So I said, let's find another bird. So she came back and we walk, I don't know, 10, 10 to 20 feet. And another snipe flushes. She comes back, grabs the snipe and comes down. So perfect, let's feed the falcon. <laughs> so I end up feeding the falcon and let's go to the car. So on the way back on the car, there's this tree on the way out. I said, well, I'm just going to be curious. I'm going to walk to the tree and see what what really happened. And as soon as I get to the tree, I see the snipe dead next to the tree. <laughs> she cut two on one on, on that day. It was, a, it was a really fun one, which is not easy. I mean, it's, well, one's not easy. No, snipes, no. Let alone two. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's crazy. So, I mean, I, I mean... So as far as your favorite bird, it sounds like that she was by far and away probably your favorite she bird. Wa she was because I, I flew her for 18 years, so I had all the experience that you could think of it with that falcon. She was she was really, really good. The first year was a pain in the butt <laughs> because, if, you know, barbaries, they have the tendency to Range migrate out. and yeah. explore terrain like crazy. This bird, I was flying her here in the mountains and... One day she, we couldn't flush any, anything for her for a while, so she she would get upset and start moving. And she moved into the city, and in, back then in the city the transmitter didn't work. It was the other electronics, and I couldn't make them work. We couldn't get signal. All this interference was terrible. So I said, "That's it. That's the end of it." First season, and she had a, a you know those tags on the leg mm -hmm. with my phone number and reward. And that night, a guy calls me at night. Hey, I have your bird here. And I said, where? Where, where, where are you? He said, first, how much you're going to pay me? <laughs> and I say, back, back, back in those days, I mean, I said, like, 5,000 pesos would be like $1,000 right now. Because I wanted to make sure to get the falcon back. And he said, perfect. This is my address. Come find it. And I said, just curious, where do you cut the falcon? And he told me at La Villa de Guadalupe, which is a, it's a religious church, uh, like like this main church for Catholics in the middle of the city. <laughs> and there's a bunch of pigeons uh, back there. Uh, she caught a pigeon in the middle of the plaza, and this guy saw it, and she started eating the pigeon. He came with a box of cardboard and put it on her and took her home. And when she took it out, she was already fed with a pigeon. <laughs> and she was just landing there. And she and he saw the the tag and called me. I mean, I was so lucky to get that bird back. 
Wow, that's an, it's incredible. But I don't miss that. That part is <laughs> Barbara's life. She, she 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 had a few ones like that, and it wasn't it wasn't fun chasing Barbara's around the countries and isn't really fun. I mean, they could travel a hundred miles in an hour, and it's it's and you don't want to do that now in Mexico, especially. No, <laughs> you don't know where you can land. Well, I don't. I wouldn't want to do that where I live. Let alone, <laughs> let alone where. Yeah, I, that's nuts. Well, yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, even with GPS, sometimes the range is just too far. Yeah. <laughs> well, and as far as, um, you know, like any other kind of, is is there any other, like, other really memorable story that, that pops in your head with either that bird or another one? Uh, well, I'll, I have a recent one with Benancio, which was really, really nice flight. Um we were flying when, when the water was higher and we flushed one kill there, came down and knocked it out, landed in the middle of the pond. So I went in and grabbed the bird, was dead, hit him in the head, put him inside the, the best and we kept walking. And I said, well, probably that's gonna be it. I mean, they're pretty tough to, to catch. I don't know, 10 minutes later, we flush another one and he was way, way high. I don't know, 150 meters. He comes down and knocks the bird, killing it and again, hitting him in the head. The second one. And I was like, wow, like, size, <laughs> like ecstasy. It was crazy. I mean, <laughs> two birds in one, in, in one hunt, it's super difficult for these guys. Those are tough ones. <laughs> well, and as far as, um, I mean, do you think that the headshot success like that was attributed to kind of like you were describing at the beginning of our conversation where, you know, you toss some small yeah, birds? I, and I think little birds, they, they, they gave them a lot of aim. This guy has a good aim and, and probably they, they, they're very helpful for their food job. Yeah. I think little birds is it's what they do in the wild. They chase little birds all over the sky all, all day long. Mm -hmm. So I think I think it was very helpful and 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 he's been doing it really consistently. So as you as you saw today, uh, he killed one snipe in that stoop and was really good one, which is not easy. You saw the other chisel and he missed I don't know five or six snipes and he wasn't even close. Of course, yeah, it's yeah. they're tough. Yeah, no, I mean it's it's a, a different type of um, upper tier falconry from what i can you know tell i mean it's it's not exactly sage grouse hawking or something like that but i mean as far as difficulty goes i can tell just by you know my yeah. lim like even with my limited experience i can tell that that's very hard hawking I mean, yeah you don't need the falcon to be like way lost in the sky i mean that's useless yeah you won't catch any right but uh you need it to be i don't know 80 to 150 that that's i think that's perfect yeah. From a hundred meters, you'll catch anything that's fast enough for any, if you flush them at the right time, of course. Sure. But uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's different. It's different kind of falconry. I mean, I enjoy catching dogs with the other peregrine, which is always fun. But uh, catching snipes is other, another thing. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And, and everybody, well, and everybody's thing is their thing. You know, not everybody has the same view of uh, what their ultimate form of falconry is and, and whatnot. But uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I'm I'm very uh, appreciative that, you know, you guys were able to, you know, take me and, and show me this stuff this week. And, you know, I'm, I've been very happy to be able to experience something new that I haven't gotten a chance to yet. And uh, yeah, I mean, I really appreciate it. And I want to go ahead and end on the same note that I have been ending on with a lot of different falconers, especially ones that are, that have been doing it for as long as, as you have. And what particular piece of advice or sentiment or, um, follow your passion. Don't stop at it. Otherwise life sucks. <laughs> you don't want to, you don't, you don't want to stand there. I mean, life is short and, and time goes by pretty fast. So follow your passion. If your passion is falconry, do it, do it good. Go into it deep. Get in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And you know, for those of us that 
or for those of the the people that that work the uh, the nine to five grind and and everything else, I mean, is there any particular things that you want to? I don't know if it, for any of the people, in other words, that might have a little bit more trouble achieving that day to day consistency. I mean, is there any other piece of advice that you would have for for them in particular as well? Buy a shotgun and then go hunting <laughs> with a shotgun because with falcons it's gonna be tough. Yeah, to switch jobs. I mean, yes, yeah. it, it all depends. I mean, people manage and and sometimes I I've read books. So you know the the bird in the hand. These guys from the British Falcon Club. Mm -hmm. This guy was I, I remember one guy that was a lawyer and, and he will hunt for a month. He will won't do anything. He flew the falcons for a month and catch. Uh, sage crowds and then came back work 11 months yeah for just for one month i'd rather do it the other way around yeah. try to fly them every day and catch game and and do uh, as less as possible that i can <laughs> well what i mean out of curiosity then though what if you would have found that being a lawyer or your career would have you know interfered too much and you wouldn't have been able to work around that would you have just switched careers then i probably would because <laughs> no, the, not really. Because you you go miserable and you hate your life. I, I experienced that for eight years, living in California in in Southern California, which is considered a paradise for most of the people around the world. <laughs> and I was miserable. Yeah, well, yeah. And if if you're not getting the chance to do the things that you really enjoy, it doesn't really matter. You no know, matter you, what you're doing, if you're living in Southern California or Hawaii or you know or uh, it's a golden know, wherever. jail. I yeah, mean, it doesn't matter. You you gotta do what you like. Yeah. Well, I mean that's it's a good point, and I know that um, you know sometimes people can't hear that enough. I mean, I there's times where I wish that you know I I would have gotten into something different myself, but um, luckily at least my career, if nothing else, is afforded me at least a little bit more flexibility, you know, during the week and the schedule. Yeah, you'll, stuff, you'll you find know. a way. Yeah, I mean, if it, where there is a will, there is a way, for sure. You'll find a way. They always do. People yeah. will get other jobs, other, other sort of income and, and practice the sport. Yeah. No, I agree. Like I said, if you want to do something bad enough and, and the will is there, then most people will find a way to yeah. persevere, for sure. Yeah, besides, it's not easy, falconry. I mean, you... You know it. You you gotta really, really push for it. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, hunting with certain species of hawks and hunting with with peregrines and long wings and stuff are two completely different animals. There's no question about that. So, well, it's been a great talk. I really appreciate it. Thank you for you know having me come over and and do this with you and show me some snipe hawking and. Um, oh, my pleasure, Jan. It's yeah, been it's, fun. Yeah, it has been fun. I'm I'm very happy to have met you and gotten a chance to to talk and get to to know you better as well as these other guys. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, I don't know. Sounds like it's time to have another uh, to, another Take beer and a little bit more tequila. And yeah, and paella. Some... We're gonna have a nice paella now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, sounds good, and we'll uh, we'll talk again soon. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.